Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Al Hewer. I am Terry's partner in um, A&T le Lectures. I want to welcome you today. I'm also a professor at Rutgers School of Health Professions. I co-edit Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care textbook, as well as a couple of others. Um, I'm also a, uh, a lead respiratory therapist at a major uh, medical center in northern New Jersey. Um, and uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm a busy guy, just like probably a lot of you, very, very, very busy. But really want to welcome you to today's session. Um, this particular one is on pulmonary infectious diseases. So some of the learning objectives we're going to look at, we're going to describe some of the uh, pathophysiology of pulmonary infectious diseases. Um, about two thirds of the lecture is really going to focus on adults, but the first part is going to focus on a couple of disorders that are inherent in children. We'll review the manifestations uh, of the various diseases, discuss the treatment, uh, examine some new discoveries related to COVID-19. So this presentation is not a presentation on COVID-19. Uh, Terry and I uh, do have a, a, a series that's actually dedicated to COVID-19, but we would be remiss if, if I didn't include some, given that this is a, um, you know, a, a presentation on infection control, if I didn't mention um, some facets of COVID-19 and infection control regarding it. Probably most importantly, I'll be providing you guys with additional resources um, if this topic you know, is of particular interest um, and you want to drill down and find out more information. So brief history and evolution of infectious diseases. I'm still one of these people that gets amazed that you know, in the middle of the winter, you can, you can be 19 degrees in New Jersey, hop on a plane and you know, you can be in a warm climate in three or four hours, you know, so it's just, it's just kind of, I'm, I'm amazed by things that other people aren't necessarily amazed by. I'm also amazed by the fact that it was a little over a hundred years ago that there was little to, to nothing known about infectious disease, okay? The prevailing thought, you know, around 1900 uh, was that disease was caused by bad air or night air, okay? So that fog that might kind of hang out in the low-lying areas, was kind of thought to be really shouldn't walk through it, you shouldn't breathe it in, it can cause disease. And this theory was known as the miasma theory. It's completely unsubstantiated. Going back several centuries before then, in the late 1600s, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, he actually discovered bacteria, but he didn't know it was what's called pathogenic. He did not know it caused disease. And it was in the late 1920s that Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. It was really by accident. It was, and indeed, it was by you know uh, uh, basically mold that he grew on bread. Um, he inoculated petri dishes with bacteria, and then he put the mold um, in those petri dishes and noticed that there was this zone of inhibition, that the bacteria did not grow in an, in an area that was around that that particular, um, if you will, you know, fungus that had the, the the penicillin um, antibiotic in it, or the precursor to that, um, to penicillin. Some key terms that we're going to look at before we drill down, uh, a virus, and a lot of us maybe are much more um, attuned to what actually a virus is with all the attention that's paid to COVID-19, but it's really a very, a very simple, um, in some respects, in its actual uh, structure. It's a fairly uh, uh, a simple microbe. So it's, a, it's an RNA or a DNA strand with a protein coat that's contained in a lipid envelope. Bacteria, on the other hand, are cells that can independently multiply. So viruses, as we know, or we, we probably know, um, they need a host. So they're, if you will, they're uh, obligate parasites. They need a host. They need a living host. Bacteria, on the other hand, can independently multiply. They do not necessarily need a host. Other microbes, and we'll go through a few of the others, but protozoa, rickettsia, and a host of others that are out there as well. Pathogenic um, really has to do with, with what I referred to uh, earlier with um, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, when he actually you know, discovered that there was bacteria, but didn't know that it was what's called pathogenic, or it had the ability in some cases to cause disease. Virulence has to do with the ability to cause severe disease, severe disease. Transmission, the route of spreading, um, sterilization versus disinfection. So sterilization is the elimination uh, of all microbial life 
disinfection is the removal or the uh, deactivation of what we call vegetative microbial life. So you're really differentiating in sterilization versus uh, disinfection. You're differentiating um, you know, between spore formers and non-spore formers. So non-spore formers are what's called vegetative or living uh, bacteria uh, or microbial life. Um, you have these spore formers that, that are, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, we, we, we have, um, you know, uh, different, different microbes that reside in the environment, okay? Um, you know, we have tetanus, Clostridium tet tetanus is a spore former. Um, we have C. diff, so uh, Clostridium uh, uh, difficile uh, is another spore former. And one of the ways that that manifests itself isn't just in the microbe itself, but is the way that we actually need to, um, the, the, the infection control protocols that apply to spore formers. So in order to actually kill them on surfaces, we need to actually use a more rigorous approach. To actually get rid of them on hands, we need to use something more than just the, um, you know, the, the um, substances that contain um, alcohol. You need to actually use for, for like C. difficile, you need to use vigorous hand washing and not just the alcohol containing rub. So some of the diseases we're gonna focus on today when we look at pediatric respiratory diseases, so croup and epiglottitis, I'll spend a little bit of time on those. And then we're gonna turn our sights to uh, tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia, uh, briefly on SARS, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 as well. And then we have some summary slides at the end. So croup, the etiology, so really kind of to our etiology, we're talking about the root cause, it's viral. And the most common viruses that are implicated are power influenza, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, and adenovirus. It's actually adenoviruses or a family of viruses. Um, relative to uh, epiglottitis, croup has a more gradual onset. It also tends to affect children of a younger age. So six years to about, six months rather, to about three years of age. A little bit on the croup pathophysiology, so the swelling and inflammation of subglottic structures, the larynx, the trachea, and the larger bronchus. However, it can also affect midsize and smaller airways as well. Croup has, a, again, a, as we said, a slower onset, tends to be less severe than epiglottitis, uh, so more like a cold. It can result in uh, brassy or barking cough, uh, hor hoarseness, Audible strider is a bit redundant in that most strider you can hear without a stethoscope. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you a, an example of what you might see in a neck x-ray with a, a patient who has a moderate to severe case of croup. And it's the classic sign. If, again, you'd find it in maybe about 70 or 75% of the cases, what's known as the steeple sign. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. However, croup can be severe. And if it is severe, it could be accompanied by tachycardia and tachypnea retractions, a decrease in blood oxygen, and an ABG concomitantly, an ABG which re reveals hypoxemia and respiratory acidosis. Steeple sign is here, the arrow kind of points to it. So what you're seeing here, kind of that, the, the, you're seeing the trachea. So this kind of darkness that tends to narrow, um, you're actually, you know, it's a, again, a, a finding that you would see in, you know, approximately, you know, three quarters of the cases. And it's really owing not to the airway itself, but to the swelling of the tissues around the airway that result in this narrowing. This, it doesn't come quite to a pencil point, but it looks like a steeple sign or a pencil point. The treatment, the treatment is, you know, it depends on the severity, if you will. Um, again, if it's a mild case, it can be just a lot of supportive therapy monitoring the patient. Um, you know, typically, you know, you'd find that um, a fair amount of these patients might be briefly hospitalized. In some cases, if it's a mild case, they may actually just present to the ED and go home with, let's say, bronchodilators, close monitoring, antipyretics, things along those lines. So cool mist with oxygen via face tint or face mask. Reassurance of the parents are obviously um, in, involved, not just broadly speaking, but if the kid does present to the emergency room and is eventually admitted, the parents are very involved in that, in that plan of care. Perhaps the kid hasn't slept in days. They may be very difficult to even administer, whether it be racemic epinephrine um, or, and or bronchodilators can be, you know, they could just be very irritable. 
and their enlisting the parents help can be very useful. If racemic epinephrine is uh, indicated, um, again, you can use a half dose. So the strength of racemic is always, uh, inhaled version is always 2.25%. Um, however, the actual volume would be, uh, you know, a quarter of an ml or 0.25 mLs that you'd, of course, dilute in normal saline. Um, but just a kind of a guideline or a cutoff would be if, if, the, if, the, if the child is more than six years old, you tend to use a normal dose. And the normal dose is, in fact, a half an ml of the 2.25 that you'd, of, of course, dilute. And there's certain cases where with, if the child is less than six years old, they'll just give them the full dose as well and just monitor them very carefully. Systemic steroids can offer some advantage um, at a varying dose that's actually, again, uh, based on ideal or predicted body weight. Uh, intubation is not that common, but mainly if it's a severe case and the patient is exhibiting signs and symptoms of respiratory failure, um, whether they be these, you know, uh, subjective signs that you could see the muscle fatigue, it really, you know, retractions and things along those lines, or they can be objective measurements such as ABG results. Um, and, and others that you can actually see. So now we're, we're switching over to epiglottitis. And part of the reason why I, I've chosen these two, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm still a, a respiratory educator uh, and I'm, I, I am a co-owner and a co, I, I you know, co-sponsor a um, NBRC, a few nurses, the NBRC is National Board of Respiratory Care. They actually, you know, they create and administer the uh, credentialing exams. Okay. And I know for a fact that the folks that write those exams, even if it's not the neonatal pediatric specialty exam, the NPS exam, they really do like to test the knowledge and the ability of the, the respiratory therapist to be the graduate from, a, from an accredited respiratory program for them to help distinguish between diseases like croup and epiglottitis. They're not the only two diseases they want, you know, these individuals to be able to distinguish uh, between or amongst but you know, clearly it's a theme that's emphasized. So I was kind of a little bit, um, you know, perhaps a little bit uh, pejorative in, you know, in selecting these two. Uh, but in any case, it, has also, it also plays to critical thinking skills, which obviously we need not just to pass the exams, we need at the bedside to be better clinicians. And you could argue that, you know, to be the best person you can in life, you know, critical thinking skills to be able to manage your life and your finances and things on your relationships are important as well. So coming back to the topic at hand here, being able to use critical thinking skills to distinguish between epiglottitis and croup is also important. So hence, I've selected them for, for this focus. So epiglottitis, unlike croup, is a bacterial infection. Uh, most common microorganisms or are, um, you know, staph uh, or aureus or aureus, however you choose to say it, group A, B, uh, streptococci, and strep pneumonia. Uh, other causes, so, you, so, you know, again, if it's, an, if it's someone who's, you know, let's say 25 or 45 or 65 years old, some of the other causes can be thermal uh, injury, uh, caustic injection, uh, or ingestion, ingestion, or radiation exposure, whether it be inadvertent or deliberate uh, to treat diseases like um, malignancies. Pathophysiology, so supraglottic, supraglottic swelling. Um, and in the x-ray I'll show you shortly, you'll gain a further appreciation for that. The epiglottis turns uh, bright, cherry red, it's swollen, inflammation can lead to airway narrowing and dysphagia, so the inability to swallow. If severe airway, the airway can become completely obstructed. So some of these uh, children, when they present to the emergency room or the doctor's office, is they're kind of leaning forward, they look really sick, they may be drooling because they're dysphagic, because it's just so painful, their airway is so swollen and it's so painful uh, for them to even swallow their own saliva or mucus that they are just, they may just be leaning forward and drooling to let, let it run out of their mouth. Uh, the clinical manifestations, um, patient appears acutely ill, uh, and more ill, more ill than they would with croup. If you took 100 patients that have epiglottitis, 100 patients that have croup, the epiglottitis group would tend to appear sicker. More rapid onset than what you find with croup, affects mainly children one to five years old. So it's not old, but older than croup uh, age group. Drooling, sore throat, as I mentioned, dys dysphagia, strider, hoarseness with diminished breast sounds over, you know, could be broad, you know, broadly uh, presented over a lot of lung re regions. A high fever and the lateral neck x-ray, again, you'll find it many, though not all the cases, a balloon-shaped epiglottis, and it's known as the thumb sign, thumb sign. And you can kind of see here, so here it's not the patency, it's not the, the, the darkness, okay, 
or the radio lucent, which is the darkness. What the thumb sign here, you know, so, so with croup, the steeple sign was radio lucent. Okay, it was the patency, it was the opening. The thumb sign is radio opaque. It's not literally white, but it's white or gray. Okay, so this is the actual tissue. This is the opening. This is the tissue, the epiglottis that's swollen, okay? Swollen to approximate the shape of a thumb. And hence it's, it's, it's you know, you can actually see it in an X-ray reflected as a, you know, as a partial obstruction of that upper airway owing to a very swollen epiglottis. The treatment, you know, minimal patient stimulation, meaning you know, unnecessary stimulation. Keep that to a to a, a, a minimum because you may whatever patency you have in the airway, if the kid gets very excited, you may lose that. Cool mist aerosol with supplemental oxygen would, would offer some advantage. Uh, antibiotics because it's bacterial uh, fluids. If the kid can swallow, uh, for some reason it's not fully understood. Steroids tend to not offer a significant uh, clinical advantage in, in these patients. Um, if there's a severe obstruction, intubation should not be attempted in the ER unless there's no other alternative. Um, the idea is, you know, the, the patient uh, hopefully has some patency. Um, you'd know it if they weren't because they'd be cyanotic um, and they'd be in, in absolute, you know, severe distress and perhaps in a code blue. Um, uh, but, they, you know, the idea is if you attempt to, if a learner or a less experienced clinician attempts to intubate, and stimulates that airway in the wrong way, it could cause a, a laryngospasm, and now you have no you have no uh, patency at all. So uh, ideally, the patient should be intubated in the OR as a trach may be necessary, um, and the patient may need with you know a rapid sequence intubation involving uh, paralytics and, and sedation, obviously. So now let's turn our sights. Looking at we are we're fine with time. Turn our sights to some of the the uh, adult uh, pulmonary diseases. Tuberculosis, so it's a, a family. It's the it's the Mycobacterium family. So the different strains of tuberculosis. Uh, it's it's spread mainly by airborne transmission transmission of droplet nuclei. So it can be droplets. Okay, it can be droplet nuclei. And all the droplet nuclei is droplets. So aerosol droplets do not form arbitrarily in the environment. Okay. They form around a little nuclei, a little piece of dust, strand of dust, okay? Um, and when the droplet, when the moisture in the droplet evaporates, you still have this nuclei. So I'm gonna call that a piece of dust. It's not literally a piece of dust, but a piece of dust that is able to remain airborne. So it's smaller, it's, it's able to remain airborne. And the bad part is, is that the uh, bacilli, the bacteria, it's small, but it's large enough where the, the bacilli can take a ride on it, okay? And it also travels, again, as I said, it travels further. So again, when people say, what's the safe zone? So six feet is safer, safer than three. Nine feet is safer than six, et cetera. There's studies that say that droplet nuclei can travel, you know, 12 feet, um, in some cases more. The, the, that's the bad news. The good news is that um, distance matters in terms also of dose. So the further you are away from the source of the, dro of the droplets or the droplet nuclei, the less of a dose you're gonna get, if any at all, okay? And dose is one of the, um, if you will, factors that will determine number one, do you get sick? And number two, how sick you get. So I'm gonna jump ahead here and say, with COVID, there's so many variables and we're still discovering a lot of why some people, why a relatively small percentage of people get so profoundly ill and some unfortunately die. One of those factors they strongly postulate is related to the dose that you've gotten, okay? Um, I, I could say more, but you know, again, this isn't a COVID-19 lecture, but just in, in relation to the spread of, of different diseases, including tuberculosis, that you have this notion of droplets and droplet nuclei. The droplet or droplet nuclei settle into the lungs and can start the infection. I say can start the infection. They probably will replicate, okay? But the risk of infection is determined by many, many factors. The length of exposure, not just the length, but the actual dose that you get, the patient's immune status, and all the other variables that, um, and, and then some that, we, that we've all become more familiar with in the context of, um, uh, of uh, COVID-19. Pathophysiology of the acid-fast bacilli are inhaled, begin to multiply. 
Uh, they may migrate to the kidneys, brain, bones, and other sites. Six to eight weeks after the infection, the immune system will often localize and contain the infection. Okay. So the, here you, you get these terms, TB infection, TB disease. TB infection is the bacilli become inactive, but remain. They're still in the body. They become walled off, if you will. Um, TB disease is the active bacilli are not stopped by the immune system. They continue to multiply. Or they're stopped for a while, but then something else happens. The patient becomes immune, immunosuppressed um, through a, another disease condition or a medication that they're started on. So some of these medications for psoriasis that you read about and other autoimmune diseases that are designed to squelch this inflammatory cascade due to an autoimmune response can also leave these individuals that have TB infection more predisposed to develop TB disease. So some of these commercials will say, you should be tested for TB before you start on this regimen because of X, Y, and Z. I don't mean to sound flippant. It's a, it can be a very serious matter, um, but it's just something to kind of tie into some of the things that you, you all you know, may be seeing and hearing on, on uh, social media and TV. Clinical manifestation. So I, I, the reason why I put the, the positive MAN2 test or PPD stands for purified protein derivative. Um, the reason why I put the various criteria, 5, 10, and 15 millimeters is that for somebody who's demonstrably immune suppressed, the criteria for a positive lesion is different. So someone that has, you know, full-blown uh, AIDS, I'm just, you know, thankfully there's, that's not a common scenario, but that the criteria would be different for them versus somebody who has a robust normal immune system. The x-ray, um, the lesions will often, though not exclusively, appear in the apices. Um, and the reason for that is really, as I say, the, the affinity for acid-fast bacilli for higher oxygen environment. And there is the, the, the fact of the matter is due to density issues, there's a higher oxygen tension in the upper portions of the lung than the lower portions. So if you took a thousand patients that have active disease, uh, TB disease, you'd find, and, and, and have abnormal x-rays, you'd find that a higher percentage of them are in the middle and upper por portions of the lungs. Positive sputum culture, it's a, you know, it, it's a, a acid fast bacilli. They do not like to uh, grow, if you will, in vitro or outside of the body. Um, so many times, a lot of these protocols are to take three specimens over three, either three days or three successive shifts. Um, laboratory data, so increased band, so those are the, the immature white blood cells, elevated alkaline phosphate is really secondary to uh, a metabolite of the ongoing infection. Um, signs and symptoms, productive cough, some of the things that we're familiar with, chest pain, hemoptysis, weakness, weight loss, fever, chills, night sweats, and the like. This is an x-ray really kind of showing you a cavitation, and it's really surrounded by a, um, if you will, a consolidation in the patient's um, uh, upper right lung. Treatment, the theme with the treatment, rather than kind of go through it, because there's a lot of different treatments that are out there, is that there, there are an abundance of different treatments. So I've mentioned some of the drugs that are, um, that, that are used here, rifampin being one of them, um, for whatever it's worth, the first effective antibiotic against tuberculosis was streptomycin. And it was actually developed at Rutgers University, um, the school that I work for. Not, not, I apologize, the university I work for, not, not the actual school. Um, but, but since then, it's been around so long. Since then, a lot of the strains of TB have become resistant um, to, uh, to streptomycin. It's still one of the drugs that can be combined with others. But because so many of the strains are, are at least partially resistant to streptomycin, it's not a first line drug. Um, and then you have these, you know, you, you basically have MDR, so multiple drug resistant strains. They're very, very troublesome. Um, it's theorized that they've come to be because individuals who are taking their antibiotic regimen for tuberculosis, they start to feel better. And they will, if it's an effective regimen, the patients are going to start to feel better, notably so, in two to four weeks. Okay. But they need to continue to take their, their regimen in order to eradicate that, you know, that strain that they have. And if they stop taking it, the many times what happens is that strain will re-proliferate and it will develop a resistance against those drugs that the patient was given. Also supportive care um, can be a viable option. So before streptomycin and any of these other medications that were, were developed, 
Um, it was, uh, you know, basically the way they treated these patients is they sent them, if they could afford it, they sent them to sanitariums um, in Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, they, they received rest, good nutrition, if they could tolerate moderate exercise, moderate exercise, and a lot of them improved. They were not cured, but they allowed their own immune system to kind of keep the disease in abeyance. So let's focus on pneumonia, okay? And I don't mean to imply that, you know, pneumonia exists in a vacuum and that somebody can't have tuberculosis and have pneumonia, of course they can. Somebody can have COVID-19 and have pneumonia, of course they can. Uh, but just for the sake of this presentation, I'm treating them as related, but a separate disorder. So you have community acquired and nosocomial or hospital acquired. Um, some of the pathogens that you'll see are bacteria or various forms of bacteria, viral, others such as fungal, rickettsia, protozoal, and others. Some uh, pneumonia, the pathophysiology, often, uh, you know, uh, basically inhalation is often the root of spreading. Um, and again, the microbes I mentioned uh, before, I did add, you know, a fungal infection known as cosidiodes or valley fever. And I threw it in there because, um, you know, when I, when I, when Terry and I both went to school, uh, respiratory school, we had uh, Dr. Craig Scanlon was our instructor, and he was uh, then the senior editor for Egan's Fundamentals, um, which is the reason why a lot of us chose to go to UMDNJ Rutgers program. Um, and I remember him telling us how, and it was in the context of an infection control um, lecture, and telling us that he and his family went to, did a road trip, like, uh, like, the, like the Chevy Chase movie, Vacation. So they drove, it wasn't from the Midwest, it was from uh, New Jersey all the way out to, to uh, California. They were driving through the San Joaquin Valley. Um, they came home and Craig got sick, um, respiratory sick. And they you know, treated him with antibiotics. They treated, treated, he didn't get better. Uh, finally went to a doctor that kind of drilled down and said, this is unusual, something else here. You know, are, you, are you immune suppressed? They tested him, he was not immune suppressed. Uh, in fact, his immune system was responding, you know, very in a very robust manner to the to the respiratory infection he had. He had, had a lot of mucus, um, and they tested him and found that he actually had a fungal and he had valley fever. They started him on, on antifungals, and he improved. But it was just this weird this weird thing. So, you know, I I run it. I ran it to. I was presenting at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona. That the van driver from, drove me from the airport to the to the resort that, we, that I, where I was presenting. Also, I just told, told him I'm also a respiratory therapist, blah, blah, blah. You know, I added textbooks and he's like, wow, I'm, just, I'm recovering from valley fever. <laughs> it's just this weird thing that we don't see a lot of valley fever in New Jersey, but you know, sometimes if it doesn't respond to other things, just broaden your thought process. So uh, pneumonia, some of the clinical findings, you know, yes, there is such a thing as um, a walking pneumonia. So that not all these patients are acutely ill, but unfortunately a higher percentage of them are. You know, you know, think about what pneumonia means. It's really consolidation that, that at least a portion of the lung is not aerated, okay? It's filled with mucus and fluid uh, and, and swollen lung tissue. Um, so you know, that's where the, the terminology, you know, pneumonia has a very specific meaning. So, you know, you know, again, patient doesn't have to be acutely ill, but a lot of them are. They may have concomitant uh, hypoxemia, possible cyanosis in severe cases, uh, chest x-ray showing consolidation, again, consolidation, lack of aeration. So it, it would be not radiolucent, but radio opaque. So, you know, white or light gray. Unilateral chest expansion, if it's a unilateral pneumonia, a dull percu percussion note. So we don't really percuss a lot, but it is, it does appear on our credentialing exams. I've seen it done. I've done it on rare occasions. Um, and, you know, what you have is instead of it being a normal, what's called a resonant note, or a hyper-resonant would be kind of really hollow that you might have like a pneumothorax. Um, conversely, a dull note is you, you, you don't have, you know, a lot of, if you will, air in the lungs and it sounds more solid. So you have a dull percussion note over pneumonia, over atelectasis, over let's say a, a, a tumor, a large lung tumor. Uh, decreased breath sounds and or ronchi, uh, cough, productive or non-productive, you know, just vary. A lot of times they're productive, Sometimes they're not productive initially and they get productive. And I threw this last bullet point in here. So we, you know, I, I, we, we should really not make a definitive diagnosis based on the color or even the smell of sputum, okay? So let me just say that. But, but there can be some value to looking at the, you know, the consistency, the color, the smell. And you know, like, again, not unusual if it's thick, foul smelling and green, it may be pseudomonas, okay? 
Um, yellow may be some forms of uh, gram positive. Um, current red, current red can be um, uh, you know, sometimes associated with uh, haemophilus uh, and influenza. Um, gray, just FYI, can be Legionella. Again, not 100% definitive, but something that can give you some guidance. And in fact, um, you know, not so much today because there's a lot of Medi centers that you know, they can do culture and sensitivity, maybe take longer to get it back than if it's at a hospital, but a lot of these tests can absolutely be done. But as far as maybe having an idea of the microbe, kind of narrowing it down a little bit that give a little bit more speculation where that testing is not available or you know quick results are not available and the patient's very ill, that based on you know what's going on, you know what kind of infections are going on in the community, how those uh, you know what my, my, uh, antimicrobials those infections are responding to, as well as other clinical findings such as the color, the, you know et cetera, et cetera of the sputum, um, it might give some guidance on you know how to proceed. Uh, types of uh, bacterial pneumonia, so gram positive, um, aerobic, gram negative, aerobic, anaerobic, and then the microbacteria that I spoke of earlier. This is just showing you actually a few things. It's showing you when we talk about gram positive, gram negative. So you know when it's gram positive, you know gram staining, um, does it hold? Does it does it stain blue? Does it stain red? Okay, so if it stains blue, it's positive. It, you know, or it's negative if it stains red. Okay, and then you have the shape. So you have the bacilli, um, you know, would be rods or cocci, which would be round. And then you can also have bacilli that are in chains. So they're actually connected. And you can see some of those, some of the example here as well. So this, this slide is just to kind of give you an idea when you see this on a, I'm not a laboratorian, okay? I have an, a, pre, a great respect and appreciation for laboratorians, complex job. Um, but uh, I don't know how they, you know, spend all that time looking in micro, I, I would, it would drive me crazy just looking in a microscope, but I have great respect for them and you know, for what they do. And it's extremely valuable. Um, but this slide just kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that, you know, when they're actually looking at, you know, the, these microbes or some of it's automated when, you know, an automated, um, you know, visual, visual image uh, is being analyzed that it's, you know, they're, they're looking for these sorts of, uh, of or changes in order to make a diagnosis. Um, some of the treatments, so supportive, you know, oxygen therapy, bed rest, proper hydration could be, you know, uh, uh, you know, CPT or other, you know, secretion mobilization, isolate the microbe through a culture and sensitivity is really important. Um, as I said before, some, they can really culture some, um, uh, you know, bacteria and other microbes quickly, others are not as quick to be cultured. Uh, and then that the culture, and then you have the sensitivity, they then expose it to a variety of of, of uh, antimicrobials and they look at things like how sensitive it is and the cost. They do absolutely look at cost because some of the most effective antibiotics, unfortunately, are very expensive and you might get one that's nearly as effective, but is, you know, one quarter of the price. So they do actually look at that as well. And then CPT and microdilators I alluded to earlier can also be part of the regimen. So a little bit on COVID-19 then we'll come down the home stretch here. Okay, we're very, very good with time here. So COVID-19, you know, you guys were probably bombarded with it, but, um, you know, like a lot of you, like many, many of you, um, not this past spring, the spring before, I spent basically every shift, you know, three or four shifts a week um, that I was at the hospital I, I work at in the COVID ICU. They were basically, except for the NICU, all of the ICUs and some of our step-down areas were converted to, um, to COVID floors, COVID ICUs, if you will. Uh, so it's a viral infection, which uh, we've all become familiar with because we, there's a lot of information that's available on, uh, on COVID-19. Spread is mostly by droplet infection. Uh, so whether it's droplet nuclei or actually the droplet itself, um, uh, interestingly enough or not, it's not much less so, much, much less so through indirect contact. So through like a, a tabletop or a box. You know, so they really, they have, when they do contact tracing, they've, they found some that they thought could be, but a very, very small percentage are attributable to direct or indirect contact. Um, we're really talking about like, you know, touching, touching a surface that someone else is touching may be infected. Um, indirect contact may also be possible, as I said, but very unlikely. Uh, the virus settles into the lung and replicates, migrate, migrates out to other body, bodily systems, such as we saw when some of the patients, you know, some of these COVID patients developed multiple system failure because of the sequelae of getting really, really sick 
getting hy hypoxemic, and then what happens is the tissues become hyp you know, hypoxic. So hypoxemia is in the blood, hypoxia is actually the tissue level, they're obviously very, very related. So you have some that, probably some slash many, that develop multiple system failure because these other organ systems were not properly uh, oxygenated. Um, however, however, it's also suspected that to uh, further complicate matters, that um, it may have also been a direct infection where the, where the virus also migrated to the kidneys, uh, migrated to the heart, um, these other body systems and replicated and caused direct, a direct insult to those organ systems as well. Some of the risk, some of the risk factors, some, some of the risk factors. So age had to do with it, male gender um, uh, a, a, of a Latino persuasion. So the bad combination was being a male smoker, obese Latino. I'm not trying to, I mean, no disrespect to any to anybody, including those in our audience, but even beyond that, but that's the, the facts are the facts. Uh, and those were some bad, bad combinations. Uh, presence of comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular, et cetera you know, malignancies or being treated for the malignancy. Um, and then things like some of the manifestations, dyspnea, the lymphopenia, leukocytosis, you know, thrombocytopenia. So, you know, people start to develop clotting disorders, you know, their platelet counts are dropping and not without fully understanding why that's all occurring. Uh, blood type A question mark. That's been postulated. I'm not sure, you know, to the extent that, that that's been substantiated. It has not been confirmed, but how how uh, robust of a correlation it is is still being examined. Pathophysiology two to ten. They think it's more like two to five. Okay, two to five, two to seven, but they're holding out that two to ten day incubation period settles into lungs, upper airways, replicates geometrically. Okay. So, you know, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes, you get the idea. Uh, most contagious, so um, most contagious one to two days before symptoms. So for a lot of us that took care, uh, really people talk about social distancing. So we're clinicians, whether we're RTs or nurses, um, and we probably know other RTs and nurses and doctors. Um, and you, know, you probably either know or yourselves were in these rooms with the sick of sick is mechanically ventilated COVID patients, okay? And I was surprised in retrospect, but about three months in, I was surprised how few of us even tested positive for uh, the antibodies. So a lot of us did not get sick, not none of us, okay? But it was well, well less than, it was in that 5% range, okay, in, in our institution. Actually, our organization is our multi-hospital system, okay? But you know, it was a fairly small percentage given that we were so close to these patients and it's postulated, not confirmed, postulated uh, that this you know, most contagious one to two days before symptoms. So let's say someone's symptomatic, but then that, that this, the actual viral shedding, if this is true, that is most contagious early on, that as they're perhaps you know, getting sicker with the inflammatory cascade, that they're they're less contagious, okay? And then you have other people that went, you know, they stayed in their house, they quarantined, they went to the store, they bought some items because they had the bio items, they come back and three days later, they're starting to manifest symptoms. And that's the only exposure that they've had. So you just kind of scratch your head and you say, wow, you know, some casual contact with somebody who's highly contagious because they're asymptomatic or whatever. Um, it's just, a, it's something that if, if you can't tell, it intrigues me very, very much. Uh, just being, you know, you guys were there, just being, it's not funny, it's a nervous, I'm not laughing, it's just this nervous laugh, thinking back, reflecting on uh, one of my other presentations that, that I do is really on the journal I kept during the, 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 the thick of things with the COVID, and, you know, just kind of different things, and you're just so close to these patients, you're intubating or assisting with intubations, there's sputum flying, you're in a room where papper dies, this happens, that happens, this is crazy as stuff, and you think to yourself, well, if I didn't get, you know, if I didn't get exposed now, I don't know, whatever, whatever. So in any event, so let me, let me get back on track here. So the severity ranges from asymptomatic to multiple system failure and, you know, septic shock and death. Um, the, the, the interesting, perhaps or not, the immune system response to these helper T's, identify the virus and send WBCs, and you actually have the antibodies, okay? So it's, the question was, you know, and it's a, still a question, that some of us have antibodies, that were effective, maybe we had other forms of, you know, not actually COVID-19, but other coronavirus infections 
that caused our body to produce antibodies that gave us some concomitant protection, okay? Or, you know, or, and or really, did our helper T's, helper T's is what, is what, what get knocked down with, uh, with AIDS, okay? Helper T's are the cells, the white blood cells that say, hey guys, you gotta come over here, send some uh, other white blood cells here, we got, we got an invader here, okay? But the helper T have, they also have memory. And, you know, did, did some individuals have protection because their helper T's were charged up from other, if you will, coronaviral infections they had that were not COVID-19, okay? Again, speculation and postulation, but it's, it's intriguing and we'll know more. We're learning more, we'll, lo we'll learn more. The cytokine storm begins, again, approximately day five peaks in, you know, about 10 to 12 or 14 days. And you have all that flooding of inflammatory mediators um, that were really very, very troublesome, you know, uh, contributing to ARDS, renal failure, uh, hepatic failure, in some cases, some cardiac issues as well. Um, so it was just, uh, you know, kind of the sequelae of things that are happening from a pathophysiological -physi perspective. Clinical findings were varied in many, and from as being asymptomatic to, you know, we had one of our therapists who uh, did get, he, he caught COVID. Um, he was not really, really sick. He was kind of like his younger guys, about 30 years old. Um, he was kind of like flu-like symptoms for a few days, but his first sign or symptom was loss of smell. That the, the shampoo that he used normally smells, you know, he's 30 year old, you know, he's manscaping himself, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And he noticed that the shampoo that he used was body wash that normally smells very distinctly, couldn't smell at all. Um, so from that, you know, mild to moderate case, all the way to the severe, the things that many of us either are familiar with directly by seeing this and witnessing it, um, or we're familiar by the news or, you know, our, our own uh, network of people through social media, friends and relatives. And this is a COVID-19, this could be a, a patient, you know, with low lung volumes, but obviously, you know, ground glass, you know, scattered opacities that you saw in many, many of these cases. Some of these cases, the latent findings was pulmonary fibrotic changes and these real sick patients, even the ones that's quote unquote recovered, that you listen to them and it'd be like a Velcro, you know, type of, you know, kind of this pulmonary fibrosis, um, you know, effect. Treatment, supportive care for the ones that, you know, release sick. Uh, remdesivir, um, the studies were really suggesting that it's probably most effective on the patients that had mild to moderate disease. The real sick ones, you know, the study saying those that got remdesivir versus those that didn't, it didn't really seem like it made a difference in those. Steroids, you know, they were administering steroids, actually low dose dextromethasone, um, even on your mild to moderate ones seemed to make a difference. Um, even in terms of there's re case reports of individuals that really felt like they had to go to the hospital. Um, the hospital was packed, you know, so they went to an Medi center, they got, they got a dextromethasone um, a prescription, they started taking it per the script, and within a day they felt demonstrably better. They weren't cured, but they felt that their breathing was a lot better. Um, again, more than case, the case, case series that really examined this. And then, you know, you're supporting your systems such as, you know, kidney failure with dialysis, et cetera, um, respiratory, the things that we're familiar with, you know, supplemental option by a non-rebreather, even doing like some places were doing high flow. Um, they were doing high flow with not exceeding flows of 30 to 35 liters a minute. Um, early intubation is uh, debatable. Um, some places were just letting it ride. And we had patients, it was remarkable that where the SATs were 84, and they're, they're in the room on their cell phones, giving you a thumbs up. Now, many of those, not all, but many of those front two days later, you know, a day later, four days later. And when they front, they front. Uh, but there are some that we, there was one who actually didn't want to be intubated, an older oriental man um, who uh, didn't want to be intubated, but they left them on because he said, oh, you can give me the, you know, the uh, non-rebreather and the oxygen. I'm just not going on a ventilator. And he, and he ended up, um, and he doc, it was all documented, and he ended up walking out of the hospital. So you have those cases as well. ARDSnet, um, what I'm going to say is ARDSnet did not seem to offer. So ultra low tidal volumes uh, down to four mLs per kg to keep your plateau pressures at 30 or less, driving pressures at less than 15, um, you know, didn't seem to offer a tremendous value, okay? Um, 
you know, you still have your mortality on, you know, if you're mechanically ventilated patients in this country, we're in the kind of 35 to 40, 45% range, you know, so getting it, needing to get intubated um, because of COVID-19 was just not, was not a great prognosticator, roughly about a, a third, as I said, or a little more than that um, died. Um, in other countries, it was as high as 70 or 80%. I'm talking about where mechanical ventilation was available. It was, you know, mortality was very high. It was well over 50%. Prone positioning definitely seemed to offer an advantage. Inhaled nitric oxide, much less so. So, you know, just, just was what you were reading about and perhaps seeing directly. Prognosis, again, with mild disease, good good prognosis overall. Uh, you could see kind of the breakdown here, less than a half a percent mortality for those less than 50, uh, but over 8% for those that are greater than 70 years old. So age matters. 12% of cases required ICU submission, 23% mortality if admitted to the ICU, 40 to 70% mortality if you're placed on a ventilator. So a little bit of concomitant conditions. What this looked at was the individual, you know, the, the concomitant disease. But you can also combine these together and say somebody could have cardiovascular disease and COPD. So it wasn't necessarily additive, but it was it was a bad, you know, if you had multiple com comorbidities, it definitely worsened the scenario and your worsened your prognosis. So take home messages were a little bit before. Um, our time here, we're doing great with time. Um, use proper infection control techniques, especially now during COVID-19, uh, maintaining an index of suspicion. So really that, that's what a lot of the, you know, the hospitals today are still maintaining, you know, wear, wear your mask. So it's an index of suspicion. They're, whether, you know, a lot of, of the hospitals, um, you know, the, the cases have really dropped precipitously, uh, particularly once in the United States but they're still you know, really adhering to these infection control protocols very tightly. Identify and utilize practical resources, participate in all appropriate training, exercise common sense and good judgment. Don't let your ego get, get in the way. So one of the things, the reason I said it is, you, know, you get a patient who's a COVID patient, um, who's ready to you know, fall out of bed, okay? And you know, we were told, do not run in the room unprotected. We don't want our patients to fall. That's not what we're saying, okay? But we also do not want to risk you're getting infected and perhaps cross-contaminating somebody else, okay? So if they're ready to pull their IV out, we don't want that to happen. Get your PP, uh, you know, PPE on um, as, as quickly, but as safely and appropriately as you possibly can and go in the room. That's really, you know, there's no super nurse, super RT, super, super uh, physician. No, 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 no. We're all adhering to the same thing. And if you have questions or need additional information, ask, which a lot of us were doing. Selected references, so just kind of line them up here. Um, with that, I want to thank you guys all for uh, coming to this session, and I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it, and I hope you got something out of it. Thank you again.